I'm going to quickly um, repeat what I said earlier for people who may have um, uh, just come in that um, at 4.15, um, unfortunately, Assistant Secretary Dave Stilwell is ill um, and he's not able to come. We are able to reschedule that speech probably for next week and we will send out emails when it is rescheduled. In his stead, we will have a senior State Department official um, who will also, of course, speak about China and U.S. policy, um, but that is going to be off the record since we did make those arrangements at the very last minute and we apologize for that, but it will be interesting, um, I guarantee. So I hope that you will all stay, uh, but before that, we have um, our terrific um, uh, proposition uh, about uh, Xi Jinping. And um, unlike, uh, uh, unlike you know, Chinese TV, you know, when it's on CNN and the screen goes black, for those of you who are watching online, you're going to be able to see this too. <laughs> so uh, the proposition is Xi Jinping will face a leadership challenge by 2025, and I'm glad that you are all beginning uh, to vote. So I want to see everybody voting in this one. Um, while I give a brief introduction. Since coming to power in 2012, President uh, Xi Jinping and party secretary has uh, endeavored to expand his influence within the Chinese political system, leading some to hail him as the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. The removal of the presidential term limits and the party's decision to not appoint a successor at the 19th Party Congress suggests to some observers that Xi Jinping has consolidated his power and doesn't face a threat to his rule. Yet in face of heightened U.S.-China tensions, a slowing economy, challenges to Chinese rule in Hong Kong, and a growing international backlash against Chinese domestic policies in Xinjiang, Others have argued that Xi Jinping faces some opposition from within the Communist Party. Here to delve into the black box of Chinese politics, I have to my right uh, my colleague, uh, the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS, Jude Blanchett. He is going to argue in favor of the proposition. And then arguing against the proposition, to my left is uh, Professor Joe Fusmith, who is professor of international relations and political science um, in the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies at Boston University. So hopefully everybody has voted. Boy, the numbers are really getting lower. It's just, <laughs> still a lot of people in the room. Come on, guys. I'm going to give you another uh, 15 seconds to see if uh, other people would like to put their, uh, their votes vote in. By the way. I, I, told, I told everybody, you know, we, yeah, don't have don't the, we don't have the technology yet <laughs> to know how each person has voted or to change your votes. Maybe someday <laughs> we will have that technology too. But we don't. We really want to know what you think. Um, yes. <laughs> well, we at CSIS are, are falling behind because uh, we let everybody have their own views. So, um, uh, this is a significant gap. We're going to see if, uh, if this can be widened or narrowed. Uh, we have 35% to 64%, and that number is 61. Okay, all right, we are going to close the vote. And we are going to start, as we have with all of our propositions, for the argument in favor of the proposition, Xi Jinping will face a leadership challenge by 2025. Over to you, Jude. Standing. Yes, please. Well, uh, Bonnie, thank you very much. Um, it, it's a shame to see that 64% of the clickers are broken. Um, <laughs> But uh, hopefully those will be fixed by the end of uh, the next uh, uh, 15 minutes. Um, it really is a, a real honor to be here today. Uh, I quickly dug up in my email my first fan note to Professor Fusmith that I sent in May 2017 out of the blue, where I had said, uh, your work, most notably Dilemmas of Reform, has been incredibly important to me. If you ever travel to Beijing, please do let me know, as I would greatly appreciate meeting you in person. Uh, he ended up writing back and, and ended up having a, a breakfast with uh, Professor Fusmith. So, so to be sharing the stage with him is, is really an honor, even if it feels a bit like squaring off against Mike Tyson. Um, but I'm going to give it my, my best shot. 
So obviously, I'll be arguing in favor of the proposition, which is that Xi Jinping will face a leadership challenge by 2025. The, the cheap way out of this would be for me to simply quote from Xi Jinping or, or party press about the number of coups and challenges that they've already stamped down, but I think that would not be in the spirit of the debate, so uh, I will take a more uh, a circumspectial approach, beginning, uh, I think, quite naturally with the climactic scene from Return of the Jedi. Um, and if, if anyone can claim to have fully consolidated power, it would be Emperor Palpatine, also known as Darth Sidious. Um, as the undisputed head of the First Galactic Empire, uh, and I hope everyone here is nodding along because they're, they're up to date on Star Wars lore, um, he controlled a sprawling regime that had strategic military bases and civilian outposts across the known solar system. His military and security apparatus was unrivaled, including the Imperial Guard, the Imperial Army Command, Imperial Starfleet, Imperial Stormtrooper Corps, the Imperial Security Bureau, and the much feared Imperial Central Intelligence. He oversaw the Great Jedi Purge, where we saw the total destruction of the Jedi uh, Order. And most importantly, he could shoot lightning bolts out of his fingers, levitate objects, and his office was in the Death Star, which could literally blow up planets. So if, anyone, if ever anyone should have felt secure in power, uh, it was Emperor Palpatine. And yet, and in keeping with what we know about dictatorships, it was an internal and unexpected challenge from the Emperor's closest lieutenant that brought about his end. Until the moment that the Emperor was cast down the shaft of uh, the Death Star into the reactor, Darth Vader was uh, a seemingly loyal consigliere, was a devoted supporter of the Emperor's policies, uh, and was his undisputed successor. No one could have predicted his defection, uh, and in this there is a lesson for thinking about the motion at hand. Like Kremlinologists who uh, were unable and failed to foresee the attempted coup against Gorbachev, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, so too have Death Starologists failed to predict that Luke was Darth Vader's son uh, and that Darth Vader would turn on his own master. So I hope you're not thinking, what the heck does this have to do with uh, Xi Jinping? I hope it's quite clear. Um, in his rebuttal to the motion, I expect that Comrade Few Smith will uh, build his case based upon um, how General Secretary Xi Jinping has firmly ensconced himself in power. Uh, you will undoubtedly hear about all the titles he holds. You'll hear about how his name is enshrined in the party and state constitutions. You'll hear about how, after the recently held fourth plenum, uh, Xi Jinping has emerged stronger than ever. You'll hear how he's called the people's leader, how he's been effectively able to purge and sideline rivals, uh, exercise extraordinary control over uh, the Politburo and its standing committee, and how he's restructured the mil military and security services to increase his direct control. And all of this is true, and all of this, I believe, helps prove my case. <laughs> Xi Jinping will be challenged not because he lacks power uh, or because he is otherwise weak. It is precisely because he's amassed so much, so much power and that he increasingly wields it with such a dictatorial disdain for his fellow CCP leaders that Xi Jinping is under threat. If there is one crime that a general secretary can commit in the post-Mao era, it is precisely this. Um, if you'll permit me two uh, quotes here from party lore, as the 1981 resolution on certain questions in the history of our party since the founding of the People's Republic of China, which is the actual title of the document, as it says, uh, Comrade Mao Zedong's prestige reached a peak when he began to get arrogant at the very time when the party was confronted with the new task of shifting the focus of its work to socialist construction, a task for which the utmost caution was required. He gradually divorced himself from practice and from the masses, acted with more arbitrary, arbitrariness and subjectivity, and increasingly put himself above the Central Committee of the Communist Party. The result, the document concludes, was a steady weakening and even undermining of the principle of collective leadership, of democratic centralism, uh, excuse me, and of democratic centralism in the political life of the party and the country. Uh, August 18th, 1980, Deng Xiaoping gave what I think was his most important speech, where he warned, quote, it is not good to have over-concentration of power. It hinders the practice of socialist democracy and of the power's democratic centralism. It impedes the progress of socialist construction. Over-concentration of power is liable to give rise to arbitrary rule by individuals at the expense of the collective leadership. And it is an important cause of bureaucracy under the current, certain, excuse me, present circumstances. 
I'm going to come back to Xi Jinping for a moment, but I want to discuss another Communist Party leader who, until the very moment that he was purged by his colleagues, was seemed to be um, untouchable. And I think those of us who think about elite Chinese politics don't spend enough time thinking about the rise and fall of Nikita Khrushchev, but in this case, I think it's quite instructive. Um, my friend Joseph Tarigian has a, a really fantastic paper on Khrushchev's purge, and I was reading it uh, over the weekend and was struck by uh, some of what Joseph has brought to light. The first is, in a footnote, he notes how American Sovietologists leading up to Khrushchev's purge in 1964 were essentially split. On the one hand, you had many who saw Khrushchev as having near total dominance over the political system. He was unrivaled, unchallenged. Um, the others believed that there was a fierce political struggle uh, that was currently undergoing within the Central Committee and that uh, Khrushchev was, at that point, uh, been able to best his foes, but that was, uh, if anything, temporary. That's one thing I think is important, is we've seen this play before. Uh, the second is, regardless of uh, how we retroactively come to think of Khrushchev as a bit, you know, a, a bit portly, a bit dawdling, um, and because of his purge, we seem to view that as necessary and deterministic. In fact, Khrushchev was a formidable political actor who had clawed his way to the top after the death of Stalin. Um, and from Joseph's paper, he quotes the then head of the KGB during Khrushchev's demise, who later remembered that Khrushchev, Khrushchev had, quote, crushed the likes of Melenkov and Molotov, all of them. As the saying goes, nature and his mama provided him with everything he needed, firmness of will, quick-wittedness, quick and capacity for fast, careful thinking. To quote Joseph's own analysis, up to the moment of Khrushchev's defeat, his associates generally acted, toward him, obse acted towards him obsequiously, and even his most outlandish ideas were swiftly executed. So behind the facade of loyalty, opposition was building, and while Khrushchev had overseen some unpopular policies, again, there's, a, uh, I think, a, a direct analogy with today, it was the actions that threatened his fellow elite that ultimately sealed his deal. Uh, to final quote from Joseph, he says, the most likely proximate cause of Khrushchev's removal were his planned personnel reshuffles, which would have potentially weakened the Presidium members. This behavior was related to a larger problem, Khrushchev's increasingly dictatorial tendencies. So when he was finally purged, many were survived, or surprised. Many who had been watching this and knew that he was increasingly unpopular still didn't expect the speed with which this opposition arose and how his colleagues, who up to the very moment had been praising him, suddenly uh, pulled out the knives from behind their back uh, and turned on him. Um, the Air Force uh, commander who was in charge of training the commandants, or the cosmonauts who had been a long time quiet uh, foe of Khrushchev remarked in his diary, I did not think it would be that fast. So back to China and back to Xi Jinping. Before we get to the president, I want to level set on China's political system, which is to say it's always been throughout its, I don't know how many thousands of years of history it has now, but 5,000 or so, it's always been nasty brutish and often very short. Um, Wang Yuhua, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, has done some number crunching, and of the 282 emperors who have exited power throughout Chinese history, 26% of that total were deposed by other elites, including by being murdered, overthrown, forced to abdicate, and forced to commit suicide. Even in modern times, that is to say in the post-49 era, this has always been a messy affair, as, as Professor Fusmith has written so eloquently about himself. While even Mao Zedong dominated the political system from 1949 to 1976 when he died, there were always challenges to power, most notably after uh, the disastrous Great Leap Forward. Of course, we have the infamous incident of his top lieutenant and one-time successor, Lin Biao, who mysteriously died in a plane crash in 1971 after the failed or reputed plot, the 571 plot, to uh, overthrow and assassinate Mao Zedong. In the relatively serene period from 1980 to 1989, uh, we had the purge of two general secretaries, the now totally forgotten in party lore, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang. Um, even Jiang Zemin, who we don't think of as having a power challenge in 2002, had a pretty extraordinary open letter written by uh, conservatives like Deng Li Chun and 16 others, which because of the uh, three represents, which allowed capitalists into the Communist Party, they wrote that uh, they wrote a letter to the Central Committee accusing Jiang of, quote, political misconduct unprecedented in the history of the party. The, the letter uh, went on to say that as punishment, 
Comrade Jiang Zemin needs to carry out serious self-criticism within the party regarding his misconduct in order to remove ideological confusions that have been, the cause by, that have been caused by his misconduct and to undo its negative uh, consequences. So what about Xi Jinping? Has he essentially achieved escape velocity? Um, how can, can he now do whatever he wants for as long as he wants? Um, is mounting an effective challenge all but impossible? Which I think is what you'd have to be arguing or that at least he can do that uh, for the next seven years without, no, without any consequence. A few reasons why I don't think this is true beside what I've, also, I've said uh, previously. First, we're already seeing increasing signs of discontentment within the party. Um, we could go on for quite a while. I'll pick out a few. One is Deng Xiaoping's son, Deng Pufang, wrote, uh, gave a speech in September 2018 where without uh, speaking um, uh, Xi Jinping's name, like Voldemort, nonetheless said, uh, we should uh, seek truth from facts, we should maintain a clear head knowing one's own strengths and weaknesses, and we should avoid underestimating or overestimating oneself and behaving recklessly, hint, hint. We've seen in the, ra the last few weeks the leaking of documents relating to the extraordinary and systematic system of surveillance and, and imprisonment in Xinjiang. We're upwards of a million people. These were leaked by government officials. The party is dependent on documentation to move. Uh, we've not had a widespread system of leaks, but if you were looking to push back, uh, this would be one effective way to do so. We've seen the uh, longstanding, but I think increasingly pronounced problem of cadre in action. The Buzoway problem, where you just don't do anything as a way of passive resistance. This has become, you know this is pronounced because CCDI on its website oftentimes has long catalogs of all the problems with cadres not doing what Xi Jinping wants. Let's add to this a cascade of political and policy blunders. We can start at China's southern border uh, with Hong Kong uh, and events over the past six months which have been extraordinary and have led, if we now move out uh, to the north and uh, east of Hong Kong, to Taiwan, where those have had an extraordinary reverberation there, and uh, along with events in Xinjiang, I think have forever changed the political trajectory of how Taiwan thinks about uh, the mainland and reunification, and seems likely to tip the election back in favor of DPP President Tsai Ing-wen. You've had the deterioration of U.S.-China relations, which is, uh, as we talk about a lot here, certainly deeper and broader than just President Trump and is one of the few bipartisan issues in the United States. You have domestically in China slowing economic growth, fears of a middle income trap. There's not a lot for Xi Jinping to hang his hat on and say he's been successful at. So in light of these circumstances, can an increasingly dictatorial Xi Jinping continue to amass power at the expense of his uh, fellow senior leaders, all the while China confronts an, increasingly, an increasing convergence of internal and external challenges? My question is, can all of this last for another seven years? Forget about any timeline longer than that. I don't think this can hold. So very quickly, in the one minute and three seconds I have left, um, now that Xi Jinping has abolished term limits, he sends a signal to all his potential opposition that he's going to stay in power forever. What this effectively does is this pulls forward the time horizon of when you'd want to challenge Xi Jinping. Time is not on Xi Jinping's side now. The best time to uh, uh, mount an effective challenge or to try to mount one is yesterday, not tomorrow. Um, in 2022, we'll see the 20th Party Congress. Uh, these are the year when Xi faces his election. These are transition years. They're always extraordinarily sensitive times for the party. This one will be even more sensitive. This is the year of the great unveiling when Emperor Xi Jinping will announce that he is not intending to step down, as I think most of us on the stage believe. Um, that will again confirm uh, this is uh, not your old political system in China and that a leadership change is not forthcoming anytime soon. I said I'd skip over the comments by Xi Jinping about all the challenges and coups he faces, but if you'll just permit me a few quotes. Uh, in a speech January 13th, 2015, uh, in front of the fifth full meeting of, of the CCDI, Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping warned of political plot activities by CCP officials to, quote, wreck and split the party. So we know this is all the backdrop for how he's looking at his position in power. Very quickly, how might we see a challenge occur? Um, this will undoubtedly be amongst party and military elite. Um, collective action problems exist for mounting a coup or a challenge. Of course they do, but of course they're not fully and totally uh, insurmountable. If they were, 
no authoritarian leader would ever be brought down from power. Um, as the, Dar as the example of Darth Vader shows, this is gonna come from some place we may not even expect, including someone very close to Xi Jinping who knows where all the maps, buttons, and rooms are. Um, and in the end, and I think importantly, Xi Jinping, like Oz, is just a 66-year-old man. He only has power because others grant it to him. As soon as that mandate is withdrawn by a sufficient number of people, he's out of power. And it is up to uh, Comrade Fusmith to prove uh, otherwise. Thank you very much. Well, it's a real pleasure to share a stage with uh, Comrade Blanchett. <laughs> and thank you for buying that breakfast a couple of years ago. I really appreciate the hospitality a couple of years ago, and of course of CSIS today, Bonnie and so forth. And I will try to be as predictable as possible by doing exactly what you suggested that I do, um, and go through all of Xi Jinping's strengths. But let me start spending a couple of minutes on thinking about how tension arises in the Chinese Communist Party uh, and see if there are some patterns there. Uh, I tend to like to put the idea of tensions within the party in sort of two boxes. Uh, one are the midterm elections, the, the various plenum. I, I always think of this as a third plenum, you know, tension thing, because it's often between Congresses that tensions uh, build up for a variety of reasons. Uh, this could be because of new policy initiatives. You've got a new leadership in, takes them a couple of years to settle down, they decide to do something, other people don't like it. The other reason, of course, is that about that time, you're lining up your ducks in a row, thinking about the next Congress, and by the time you get to the Congress, everybody's kind of on board with what you've put together. So, you know, uh, I would always look at sort of the midterm tensions as one area of tension. And then, of course, there is the uh, tensions that sometimes come with party congresses, and those uh, are associated primarily with leadership changes. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we have seen the, a couple of those that I'll, I'll refer to uh, in a minute. Um, so, uh, you know, in the, in the 1980s, the 1980s were a fun decade because everybody could see that the Chinese political system was just filled with tension. Uh, we had campaigns against spiritual pollution, 1983. Uh, you probably don't think of the uh, uh, 1984 economic reform decision as, as tension-filled, but believe me, it was. When one of the uh, primary authors of that, Shi Mu Chao, went up to see his old boss, Chun, uh, Chun Yun, Chun Yun said, who are you? I don't know you. Politics can be cold, in case any of you haven't noticed. <laughs> Washington sometimes has that. Uh, obviously, there was bourgeois liberalization campaign in uh, 1987, uh, and, and then obviously in 1989 and so forth. So we've seen a lot of tensions. And in some ways, Tiananmen itself reflected some of these midterm tensions that I've mentioned. Uh, you had uh, tensions stemming from the ouster of Hui Yaobang, from different interpretations of economic reform, where you were going, uh, and obviously, uh, what's usually not mentioned with Tiananmen is the succession issue. Deng Xiaoping and Chun Yun are getting really old, uh, and there's a decision on the horizon. Uh, is it going to be some liberal like Hu Yaobang or Zhao Ziyang, or some more conservative person like Li Peng? There was clearly, you know, so you had leadership tensions, policy divisions, and obviously a mass movement that brought all of this sort of stuff to a head. So, you know, you always do have these, these tensions uh, that build up. Um, so in the mid-1990s, uh, you mentioned uh, 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 one problem with Jiang Zemin. I think the, um, you know, w in 1994, you really had a power transition from an old Deng Xiaoping who is mentally, uh, was mentally, was losing it. Uh, and in the fourth plenum in 1994, 
there was really a transfer of power to, uh, to Jiang Zemin. By the way, 1994 was the first of three um, party decisions on uh, building the party, party governance. Uh, the last month was the third. This was the first of those three. And gee, it, it talked about centralization of power and the need for the lower levels to pay attention to the senior levels. So some themes have remained the same. Uh, that was when Jiang Zemin was taking power, real power, uh, and uh, I wonder why he called for centralization. Um, at any case, uh, uh, that, I don't want to call it a crisis, but tension in the political system. Uh, you, one manifestation of that was the arrest of Chen Shitong. You know, that really showed who's boss. Uh, Chen Shitong was then mayor of Beijing, of course. Um, at any case, uh, we also saw some tension in 2006. Uh, Hu Jintao, for some reason, thought that he should have the power that goes with the title. Um, strange thought. Uh, and uh, he took down uh, the uh, mayor or party secretary of Shanghai, Chen Liang Yu. And you know what the result of that was? Uh, it wasn't repeating the Chen Shitong arrest to consolidate power. It turned out that you can kill the monkey or the chicken and the monkey doesn't get scared. You know, this is a problem. You kill the chicken, the monkey's supposed to run away. Uh, so when the monkey doesn't run away, you got a problem. Uh, and the monkey didn't run, a, uh, run away this time. There are three major investigative organs in the party, right? The uh, Zhengfa, the uh, Political uh, Legal Commission, uh, the CDIC, the Central Discipline Inspection Commission, and um, the... Um, uh, um, oh, public Ministry of Public Security. At the 17th Party Congress, these were all taken over by people loyal to Jiang Zemin. Go ahead and investigate me. You got no tools. You know, so that's what I mean by the monkey not getting scared. So you do have these tensions that are resolved one way or another. Um, we saw, obviously we saw really big tension in 2012 when Bo Xilai, Ling Jihua, uh, obviously Guo Bushong, Xu Tsai Ho were all taken down. This was remarkable and reflected enormous tension within the party. And I think we should, going forward, take this into account uh, because I do think that however powerful Xi Jinping is, tensions will manifest themselves in the party in the future. Um, in short, tensions within the party can emerge over policy, over the issue of succession, or both, and are most dangerous to the party when society is aroused and takes to the streets. Uh, tensions, imply, tensions imply divisions within the party, and the idea of divisions within the party implies that there are a significant number of people who disagree, at significantly high levels who disagree with each other. Um, if you don't have that, then divisions aren't there. Uh, but given this history, this litany of tensions within the party that I've just scanned over, um, you might wonder why I'm arguing the against position. Uh, but I, th I do, again, thank Jude for uh, allowing me to argue this because I think it is the easier argument as you're uh, votes before this uh, suggested. Uh, you, you, by the way, the 65% of you who voted uh, the against position were correct. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, uh, you know, um, she has, uh, over the last two party congresses, affected absolutely enormous change in China's political elite. It is absolutely overwhelming. Um, I think the only comparable period, uh, thinking post-cultural post revolution, is the sweeping leadership changes that occurred between 1978 and 1985. Between the Third Plenum, the 12th Party Congress, and the National Party Representatives meeting that everybody forgets about. That was really important. Uh, so let me, to argue this proposition, let me go through some of the data particularly from the 19th Party Congress, uh, because the data from the 19th Party Congress is, is really surprising. 
Uh, as you know, a lot of the attention two years ago was, will Wang Qishan retire or not? He did. Oh my God, it's following the norms. Everything's institutionalized. That was the only thing I could find that was institutionalized about that Congress. Uh, you know, normally, of course, uh, the new members of the Standing Committee are promoted from the full membership of the Politburo. Uh, and it's been nice. They've gone nicely in order. Well, they did in some ways this time, but you had to re retire three members of the, Central, of the Politburo before you could then promote the others. Uh, we've, you know, two members of the Politburo who were age 67 were forced to retire from the Politburo and take up positions on the Central Committee. The last person, in fact, the only person to do that before was Hua Guofeng. Uh, this, in, in other words, this is very unusual. Uh, the third, Li Yuan Chao, was asked to go home. And I think probably given the political tensions at the time, he was very happy to go home. Uh, it could have been much worse for him. Uh, at the Politburo level, just staying on the Politburo level, um, there were two members of the current Pol Politburo, uh, Tsai Chi and uh, uh, Yang Xiaodu, who were not even members of the Central Committee, not alternate members, not full members of the Central Committee, and they were raised to the Politburo level. We have not seen that in 30 years of reform. We had four members of the Politburo who were raised from being alternate members of the Central Committee. Uh, the only time that I can remember, or the last time I can remember that happening, was Zhu Rongji in 1994, and he had a little help from this guy by the name of Deng Xiaoping. Uh, this is extraordinary. This, these are, we haven't seen this sort of helicopter promotion since the Cultural Revolution. This is extraordinary. Um, at any case, um, Uh, oh, in the Politburo, other than the Standing Committee, you know, the regular full members of the Politburo, uh, by coincidence and by maneuvering and so forth, there were 15 empty seats that needed to be filled. And that's an extraordinary number. That doesn't happen very often. Uh, so Xi Jinping really had to reach out to his friends to fill those seats. He found 10 friends who were, you know, you can trace the background, who are close to him, 10 people, most of whom will be age eligible to continue on to the 20th Party Congress. Uh, so this was really quite extraordinary to, um, to fill the uh, uh, Politburo with friends uh, and close associates. Two members of the Central Military Commission uh, had never served on the Central Committee as alternates or full members before. To raise somebody who is not on the Central Committee in any capacity to the Central Military Commission, this is extraordinary. Um, look at the, uh, there were 40 members of the PLA on the uh, uh, 18th Central Committee. 27 of them had to retire, um, well, did retire. 11 of those 27 retired prematurely. That is to say, they had not reached the retirement age and nevertheless retired. Uh, we've never seen that before. That has not happened before in the reform period. Um, of the 205 full members of the 18th Party Con uh, Central Committee, 78 returns, uh, re uh, retained their seats on the 19th Central Committee. That's only 38%. It's usually about 50%. That tells you a little bit about the amount of turnover. Uh, only 32 people were elevated from the alternate list to full membership on the Central Committee. That's 20%. That's, it's often about 25% or so. It's not normally a, a high number. This was even lower than usual. Uh, that meant that 94, 94 people on the Central Committee, I mean full members, uh, were uh, appointed to the new Central Committee. This is 94 people who are not alternates, have never served on the Central Committee f before, are being elevated helicopter style onto the Central Committee. 
Um, and that's obviously an extraordinary opportunity to reshape and shape favorably the political elite of China. Uh, in other words, uh, Xi Jinping did more to reshape the political landscape at the 19th Party Congress uh, than we've seen since Deng Xiaoping returned to power in the early 1980s. It's really quite extraordinary. Uh, one, of the, one of the obvious problems is something like the 19th Party Congress happens and the journalists report on it the next day. A month or two later, when you can sort through the data, everybody's forgotten about it. And so it's important to remember some of this data and what exactly happened and what it shows about the personalization of power. We have not seen that sort of personalization of power uh, in 30 years. So um, I think that, and this is where I would give Jude's side of the argument a lot of credit, is that this high-handedness, this personalization, has to cause a lot of resentment in the political system. Just has to. Um, that could be the source of a real threat to Xi Jinping's leadership. The problem, of course, is how can they make their voices heard? They're no longer on the Central Committee, and that's the problem. Um, given Xi's dominance of the political elite, I just don't think that they can find a way of voicing their views. In other words, the sorts of divisions that I looked at very quickly in the um, exploring the various tensions in the past, saying that there have to be significant numbers of people at a significantly high level to be able to voice opposition, that no longer exists. And so, um, for better or for worse, uh, I'm afraid um, we're going to live with Xi Jinping for a while. As <laughs> so that, it's on that that I will rest my case. Thank you very much. OK, we're going to give each of you five minutes to comment, reply, respond to the points made by the other. Jude, you're up first. Just realized the problem, I was just so intently listening to what you were saying, enjoying it, that I didn't really start to construct a, uh, a rebuttal. So, uh, uh, so uh, obviously, I think there's a, a complete and total agreement on how Xi Jinping has, in a way that uh, was not appreciated by really anyone, when he first came to power has proven himself to be an extraordinarily adept bureaucratic and political actor. Um, there, there's debate about is, does the man make the system or the system make, make the man? Uh, some have argued that Xi Jinping came to power with a mandate to really uh, uh, purge this far because the party was, was reaching a, or had faced an existential challenge. Uh, I think no one within the senior leadership and the elders who put him in power knew how far he would push. Uh, it's, it's inconceivable that they would have because people like Zhou Yongkong probably would have put up more of a fuss uh, had they known at the 18th Party Congress that this, uh, that this guy coming in was going to set out to fundamentally remake the party, which, which Xi Jinping has done. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the comment, and I completely agree, that Xi Jinping has done more to affect enormous political changes within China than really any other leader since Deng Xiaoping, maybe 1981, 1982, when you had significant restructurings. To me, that's kind of the point, though. Um, the, the number of iron rice bowls that have been smashed by Xi Jinping, uh, the number of high-ranking cadres throughout the military security services and, and the political apparatus who, who sit in a jail just north of Beijing uh, uh, still have some prime in their life and, and waiting to uh, exact revenge. Um, I hold it to be a self-evident truth uh, that uh, people within China, within its political system, want to remove Xi Jinping. This isn't unique to China. There are people in the United States who want to remove Donald Trump. Uh, every political system has people who would prefer that they are in power than the person uh, in power. So the question is, where are they? Uh, Professor Fusmith said, we don't hear their voices. Absolutely. There's an extraordinary apparatus of surveillance and censorship, which is there precisely to make sure you don't hear about divisions within the party. It, to me, would be, however, an extraordinary leap to expect, therefore, that there's not some sort of Newtonian political force at work here where every action by Xi Jinping has a corresponding and opposite reaction. And the question is, if there's not the right of, uh, of, of exit or voice, 
then you have the pressure building some, somewhere else within the system. And that to me is what we should be on the lookout for. Uh, Pakingologists, Kremlinologists, people who look at opaque or authoritarian systems uh, have extraordinarily bad record, Professor Fusmith notwithstanding. Um, <laughs> We just don't know. This is very Rumsfeldian with known unknowns. We know we don't know a lot. We're always surprised by the speed and severity with which one, once seemingly indestructible systems come crumbling down. The Communist Party is no different. It's 89 million uh, uh, human beings who occupy this position, who occupy this uh, a political party. It's an even smaller number who occupy the political system. Xi Jinping's full-time job Every day he wakes up and says, how do I stay in power? By which he means, how do I keep this small coalition together? Not, not the 1.4 billion people. He's talking about 50, 100, 150 people who occupy key positions in the military security services, SOEs, private sector, the government and the party apparatus. How do I keep them happy? How do I make sure the pie is growing and I'm able to divide slices to make sure that they continue to vote for me? Because as general secretary of the Communist Party, you don't have an election once every five years. You're voted on every single day because you gotta keep this coalition chugging along. So I, I'll, I'll throw my challenge back at Professor Fusmith, which is, um, that's a tall order. That's, that's a tough job, and I don't think we should take seeming quiescence of the bureaucrats and cadres as evidence that, there's, that they're quiet. We can expect somewhere in the system pressure is building, and I don't think it's gonna go seven more years. You optimist. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it is interesting. You talk about people not being happy with Xi Jinping, in my various discussions, um, I think that there are a lot of people that are unhappy. Uh, uh, cadres, they really don't like Xi Jinping in part because they feel scared to death. Uh, they don't know what is not a mistake um, and so in many cases they don't do anything. Uh, they don't like the crackdown on corruption for some obvious reasons. Um, uh, Li, Lian, uh, Li Lian Zhang has a wonderful article in China International Journal, I believe it is, about the number of cadres who have stepped down from power after the 18th Party Congress. Uh, so there is at least exit. Um, you know, so there are a lot of people that don't like it. In the PLA, my assumption is that when you fire something in the range of 100 senior military leaders, that there's a lot of unhappiness. Uh, what's extraordinary is that, at least so far, we haven't seen any response. I don't deny that it's possible that somehow uh, this would happen, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, you've gotten away with firing 100 senior generals, and they're unhappy, their families are unhappy, their friends are unhappy, but you've promoted 100 other people who are very happy, uh, and so perhaps um, that's not a problem. Uh, you know, my assumption, and it's purely my assumption, maybe it's made up. Uh, remember the two weeks that uh, Xi Jinping disappeared before the uh, Party Congress in 2012? We have no idea what he was doing. I think he was a very, very busy guy. Uh, my guess is that he got agreement from the senior leadership. And by senior leadership, I mean all the retired people who are not supposed to have any power, uh, but they actually do. Uh, to carry out an extensive uh, campaign against corruption. And I would be willing to bet uh, that he actually laid out evidence for Jiang Zemin and others that says Zhou Yang Kang has to go. And I say that only because immediately after the 18th Party Congress, you started to see people fall who were related to Zhou Yang Kang. And I'll bet when the first guy fell, which was gosh, I think about December 1st that year, I'll bet Zhou Yang Kang knew he's coming for me. One of the nice things about the Chinese system is that they let people like Zhou Yang Kang dangle for two years, watching the fire get ever closer to him, and he can't do anything about it. Uh, that was the time for Zhou Yang Kang or other people to fight back. Obviously, Ling Jihua had the same fight uh, and other leaders of the military and so forth. Um, so, you know, I think that the bottom line is that if you want to fight back, you missed your opportunity. You're screwed. 
Uh, that is acceptable CSIS language. <laughs> is it not? By the way, I, I think we should add on to this uh, technological improvements. Um, now that you have to do facial recognition to sign up for your iPhone, uh, your mobile phone, and so many other forms, it is so much more difficult to organize any sort of protest. Uh, it really has gotten, the, the ability to do horizontal organization, I think, has really, really gone down. And, you know, in the past I've thought technology is no match for popular opinion. I've changed my opinion. I think technology, uh, along with all these other things, really is a match. And it could, this could go on for a very long time, at least more than seven years. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we, we had to choose a deadline, so we chose 2025. We have, I think, about 15 uh, minutes or so for Q&A, um, and we'd like to engage all of you in the, dis in the discussion before we have a final vote, and I'm glad that we have some hands. So um, why don't we start right over here? Hi, Brendan Mulvaney from the China Aerospace Studies Institute. It's framed as a leadership challenge in a nebulous way. Would it matter if we said a leadership challenge for the party, for the presidency, or for the CMC? And does it matter if he gives up one of those in a titular way, say, I give up the presidency, but I'm still going to maintain my spot on the CMC uh, and the general secretary, a la Zhang Zemin? Does that change uh, the dynamics in any way? OK, hold on to that. We're going to take one more question. Pat, in the front. Um, Pat Buchan from CSIS. Uh, Jude, my question's to you. Um, you used an historical analogy and then a science fiction one, so I'm going to stick to your historical analogy as a fan of the classic three Star Wars films. Um, my question to you is, uh, so you raised the Khrushchev analogy, right? And, you know, you spoke of, uh, as, as uh, Professor Fusmith did, you spoke very closely of the internal pressures that will face to a leadership challenge which would bring one about. But perhaps one of the, the other things to think about in Khrushchev's case was, you know, the Cuba crisis played a major role in the senior leadership putting pressure on him to, to, to stand down. What is a, which international event or what, which international pressure could be applied or is in fact perhaps is being applied that we're not thinking of in terms of forcing Xi from power. For example, what if the trade war with the United States ratchet up to a level that forces, forces his hand? So I'm interested in your views on what external pressures could be applied or in fact are being applied. Interesting. Okay. Good. Two good questions. Jude, you're up. Yeah, so I, th I think the, um, in the spirit of, of framing it, we left it vague precisely to give a, a, a wide variety of angles to, to look at this problem. And I think this is really an exercise to dive into authoritarian politics. But uh, you know, taking the question of sort of does it matter how the, the, the leadership challenge occur, I think the premise here was that something, something occurs that forces Xi from effective power, and I think that would be a, it within the party apparatus. So I think this is a binary party military leadership, he's either in power or, or, or not, is how I was thinking we, we were looking at this. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, obviously if you give up the presidency, you can't be invited to any other country. That's why, I'm, I'm quite serious. Nobody invites the head of the Chinese Communist Party to go anywhere. So you have to be a state leader, president, of the country, and then you can be invited. Uh, if he's just head of the military, by the way, the head of the, it's fascinating, we always talk about how the military has to listen to the party, but if you give up one position or the other, which one do you give up? Deng Xiaoping gave up the head of the, well, effective head and kept the, the Central Military Commission. Jiang Zemin right. did the same thing. Hu Jintao wishes he could have done the same thing. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, it makes you wonder, uh, apparently being head of the military is more important than being head of the party. Uh, just a question, do we actually, do we know if you did give up the office of the presidency, you couldn't make state visits, 
but do we know that you also, you couldn't, as the de facto political leader of, an, of a country, you couldn't still go to the United States for, it's not a state visit, but it still does all the... Well, uh, back in the days when everything was harmonious, uh, Deng Xiaoping yeah. came, yeah, uh, can, went to a rodeo. Go to a rodeo, rodeo. yeah. Uh, you know? uh, so theoretically, yes. Yeah. Um, to Pat's question, first, um, Star Wars is a space fantasy. It's not science fiction, so just want to <laughs> clarify that. Um, um, so uh, in thinking about this over the past couple of weeks, um, I've actually shifted my opinion a little bit on, um, through some back and forth with folks much smarter on this than I am, that maybe there's too much emphasis on this idea that it will be a policy failure as such that will provoke the, will provoke the, the pushback. Um, and you're seeing that narrative now. I use it myself in throwaway comments of, you know, look at the cascade of errors that is now mounting in China. Um, but I think I've convinced that actually in many ways it, 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 that's incidental. Um, one of those could be weaponized and utilized. Really the, the, the key thing would be do you have a coalition of the two or three people and then almost what you use as the proximate cause could be any number of these that we've talked about, right? It could be, um, you know, at, a, at an enlarged Politburo meeting, uh, someone bravely could raise their hand and say, Comrade Xi, you look tired. Um, you know, you've got a lot on your plate. We see that U.S.-China relations is, is deteriorating. I know you've, you've been busy thinking about Hong Kong. I know that isn't going well. Why don't we have someone younger and more able to, to step in? How about Comrade Wong or, or something like that? And, and, and crucially, you need the second person to raise their hand and say, I, I, I agree. So I, I almost wonder if we, if we put too much onus on what is the actual event, that may not be the, real, the thing we should be looking for. That would just be the proximate, proximate cause, but Heck if I know, actually, is the real answer. Okay, we'll take two more questions. In the back. Uh, yeah, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, you've talked a lot about the internal changes at the top, but there is that the very subtle uh, concept known as the mandate of heaven, that is, how the effect is among the general population. And obviously, Xi Jinping has changed policy tremendously. Uh, he has uh, created or built on this notion of Chinese rejuvenation. Uh, he has uh, brought China into the modern world. Some people are worried about that because they think it's a, a grab for uh, hegemony worldwide. But uh, it may just be an attempt by China to realize its position in the world as a major power. Uh, uh, aside from that, this has had a tremendous effect in the general population. It's my impression that Xi Jinping, among the masses, is tremendously popular. There was the, uh, the population uh, alleviation, uh, the Belt and Road, which has had some criticism, has nevertheless helped to uh, grow the Chinese economy. And anybody who would want to get rid of Xi Jinping would have to... Uh, to, would have to confront that policy and, and probably have to change it. And I think that Xi's position is tremendously strong among the masses and anybody tried to uh, overthrow him. This is not like Mao after the great leap forward when everybody is really depressed and upset and angry. This is a very popular president. It could cause tremendous convulsions within uh, Chinese society as a whole. And I don't know if anybody would be prepared to deal with that, especially given that none of them that are at the uh, top level at this point. But that hasn't been dealt with at all here. And I think this is a, is, is a very important issue, you know, because although the Chinese uh, population doesn't vote him into power, that mandate of heaven is still there and is an important factor in Chinese politics. Okay, ending with a question mark, do you agree? And uh, <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> Hi, uh, Jonathan at the British Embassy. Um, how much, in your opinion, is the direction China headed in personified in Xi Jinping? So as we debate a leadership challenge and who will be in power in the future, for US policymakers and for other countries, how much does that materially change the way we engage in the direction that China is heading in? I want to start? I'm not sure if I quite caught the... Can you, can you repeat that, Jonathan? How does it affect the trajectory of China? Uh, as in, today we're debating who will be in power in the future in China, who will be the leader. How much of the direction that China is heading in is personified in President Xi, and will a different leader take China in a different direction? Oh, I see. I, I, I'm sorry, I misunderstood a little bit uh, at first. Um, I think one of the really interesting questions 
is whether Xi Jinping will appoint his own successor. Uh, because past leaders have not really been able to do that. Uh, Jiang Zemin was something of an accidental general secretary. He wanted to promote his own aid. Uh, that didn't happen. Hu Jintao, as mandated by Deng Xiaoping, took over. Hu Jintao would have wanted to raise one of Li Keqiang, presumably. Uh, that didn't happen. So far, a leader has not been able to appoint his own successor. The sorts of data that I was citing about what happened at the 19th Party Congress suggests that Xi Jinping will indeed have that power because it seems to be a very human emotion that we not only want power and to implement our own policies, but we want them to continue after we go see Marx or whoever. Um, and uh, so I think that that's the first question. Uh, I do, by the way, think that the longer Xi Jinping stays in power, the bigger the leadership crisis will be. Uh, I, if you had extended your date on this to 2035 or whatever, I would have had much more hesitation in arguing this side of the proposition. Uh, if a variety of things, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Sino-US, trade, whatever, are seen as one ser uh, failure after another, then I think the odds of somebody taking China in a different direction are very high. Um, you know, the unfortunate thing is, obviously what Xi Jinping is playing on, including the mandate of heaven, uh, is really what we call nationalism. And the unfortunate dilemma is that the more the U.S. pushes back, which in some ways it has to do, the more you get a nationalistic reaction from China. Uh, what I think we're all concerned about is this downward spiral. And how do you get off of that? Are there some off ramps? So, um, you know, uh, just on the mandate of heaven thing, keep in mind that China under Mao Zedong was really bad. I, I mean, in terms of its economic and social performance. Uh, you know, peasants were really starving to death. Chun Yun in 1980 said, if we do not reform agriculture, Party secretaries are going to lead peasants into the city and demand food. You know, that was a conservative leader. Um, you know, Mao Zedong, if Mao Zedong had not died in 1976, if he had lived another 10 years, would there have been any challenge to his authority? Absolutely not. Uh, today, the circumstances are quite different, but I'm afraid the answer would still be the same, that you know, I would, I've thought about this Khrushchev analogy. For some reason, it just doesn't seem to me likely that China will pull a Khrushchev. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the mandate of heaven thing, um, I, it feels like you're right that there's a high degree of support for Xi Jinping, but I always, uh, um, I hesitate a little bit because we just have no idea. Um, we have no idea because we don't have anything like the tools we have available in, in modern open societies to accurately gauge levels of political support. We have none of the mechanisms, none of the votes, none of the polls. It's really based on uh, my cab driver gave me the thumbs up when I said Xi Jinping in Beijing or, you know, my friends think. Um, and there's also something called preference falsification, which is in authoritarian political systems, people lie because they're afraid. And so um, I don't think that covers everything. I think you're, I, my gut tells me you're right, that there is a higher degree of, of tacit support for Xi Jinping as a, as a big, strong nationalist leader than, than we give credit for, or because, as you say, of poverty alleviation programs. But, but I feel like I, I don't want to take that too far in terms of building a, a, a policy agenda around that or accurately trying to ga gauge how strong the regime is, because we just don't know. And, and then a great, great question on the, you know, post Xi, what happens? Um, I, I, just a thought on this, aside from the fact that I have no idea, is going back to that, um, this, this Dung speech, I feel like I quote it way too much, my wife is sick of hearing it, but um, in that 1980 speech that Dung gave, he basically said there's, this is after the wreckage of the Mao era, Dung's finally consolidated power, he's looking out at the political system and he says there's four great challenges our political system has to overcome if we're going to rule perpetually. Right? One is the overconcentration of power, which I mentioned at the top. The second is we can't have this, the central leader holding too many concurrent posts. As Dung said, there's a limit to any, anyone's time and energy. 
Uh, in other words, don't become the bottleneck of all bottlenecks. Uh, third is we need to get the party to clearly divide and delineate its responsibilities with the government. We need to stop having the party do everything and we need to give the technocrats and the governments more autonomy and sovereignty. And the fourth is we need to solve the long-term issue of leadership succession. The reason I mention that is it speak, speaks to me that Deng understood that there's a, a, a deep political logic or a center of gravity that China's political system pulls leaders to, right? And, and outside all the normal um, constraints on power that we have in other political system, like checks and balances, division, divisions of power, uh, external supervision through the media, voting so you can regularly change political leaders, that it sort of tends to move this, this way back to a centralization of, of power. Um, and so I just tend to think, uh, uh, even if, if uh, she was replaced with, uh, you know, with, with uh, Liu He, um, given enough time and, and outside those constraints on power, you know, anyone who's seen Lord of the Rings knows, you know, power is quite tempting. Um, you know, dropping that ring and, and, and melting it is, is very difficult, as Frodo found out. So I think this speaks to a, a, a larger problem of political power. All right, I think we're going to close it there and we are going to do our final vote. This has really been a, a terrific session. So I'm going to ask all of you again, pick up your clickers. Please do vote. You only get A or B. Um, please don't vote anything else. And let's see if we can narrow that gap. While everybody is uh, voting, um, I want to take this opportunity to thank my staff at uh, China Power. Uh, this kind of conference is truly a team effort, um, and uh, all of my staff has really put in uh, a great deal of effort. Uh, my senior fellow, Dr. Matthew Fanioli, um, in front, uh, right in the back running our slides, is uh, Brian Hart, my research assistant, and uh, unfortunately downstairs, uh, greeting our State Department official, uh, is my uh, program coordinator and research associate, uh, Kelly Flaherty, and I'm deeply grateful uh, to all of them, as well as my interns who are running the microphones around today and signed you all in downstairs, and uh, they also make a terrific contribution uh, to all of what we do uh, at, uh, at China Power. So we are voting on the proposition Xi Jinping will face a leadership challenge by 2025. Um, we started out with 35 percent um, in favor and uh, 64 uh, percent against. And so we now have 53 percent in favor and 46 percent. So I always like it when there's a total flip. We get what, very rarely get a total flip. <laughs> But uh, we're, uh, geez, we're, we're still voting. We're going to give, give another couple of minutes. But uh, it, does, it does look like um, people have reconsidered their, their thoughts on this. To everyone that this. the checks are in the mail, for all of you who voted A, <laughs> they're coming, I promise. Or yes, <laughs> they're blank checks, however. Um, okay. Um, it's a little bit this, closer. This Russian voting system we bought is great, I have to say. <laughs> uh, um, we, uh, anybody I I, else? We're going to give you another 10 seconds before we, uh, we lock in uh, our vote here. Um, uh, we, we put these all up on, the, uh, on, our, on our website, too, so that people can see the results later on. But uh, this, is, this has been a, a terrific debate. I'm, uh, I'm very grateful uh, to Jude Blanchett, my colleague. I, I guess and I Joe have Fusman. to watch and Star Wars more closely. <laughs> Maybe that's I don't know if it's Star Wars. All right. Um, thank you all. Um, please join me in thanking uh, Professor and uh, Jude Blanchett. We will be back in 15 minutes with a senior State Department official. Um, I'm going to ask all of those cameras to please shut down. There will be no recording and no live tweeting. All right.